you know, there was a coach and a player that were at odds with one another and I was the captain in the middle. A young captain at 21, a young coach at 34, and a still young assistant coach at 43, wanting to be a senior coach again. Michael Voss's extraordinary journey through football has had some amazing highs and some painful lows, but throughout it all, he has always maintained his class and he's never lost his hunger for competition. We're with Michael Voss on this week's In The Game. Vossi, thanks for your time. All right, Damo. The 43-year-old, nearly 44-year-old Michael Voss, he, is he still the competitive beast that he was as, a, <laughs> as an 18-year-old? Geez, you opened up well there, Damo. Um, show my age straight away. <laughs> no, I think I've um, a little bit more subdued than what I, what I was, um, but I still love winning. Um, so you still throw a game of Scrabble out and... Uh, game and Monopoly, and I'll give it my best shot. Um, and uh, there's no free hits to my kids, that's for sure. So <laughs> still, so that, even uh, after all this still, time, still got to earn their stripes. Yeah. So uh, they're better for it. But um, yeah, I mean, the the reason why I still coach and um, you know love what I do is because uh, the competitive element of the game. Um, you know, Lee Matthews had sort of said it to me, and it made complete sense to me. It's uh, that you know hole in the stomach that you can never fill up. Um, you try to as a competitor, but it never become you never become full. And um, so I'll just keep trying to uh, ch- keep trying to fill it up and um, keep going back to the well. So you still love the game? Oh, I love it. Yeah, um, it's been my uh, been my life. So from a very young age, um, you know, even to the point with uh, my my family have been so um, ingrained in whether it's been local sport back in or Boston, um, you know, and I've just grown up around it. So, you know, my dad's coached it, he's played it. Um, you know, he's, he's a president of the Morningside Football Club. Um, so, you know, we almost half lived at a, at a football club for probably four or five years there in our know, first few years in Queensland um, when he was president of the, of the Morningside Football Club. So, uh, yeah, it's been my whole life and I love the game, looking at it, enjoying it and watching it. He famously uh, got locked inside the Gabba, didn't he, the night you yes, won the, the Brownlow yeah, medal? When yeah. he, while the count was in Melbourne, he was watching it at a, at a big screen in Brisbane, and uh, they just locked him in there. Yeah, no, not too many people know that story, but uh, yes, he um, he was enjoying the festivities and uh, had disappeared, and they couldn't quite find him. Um, apparently, he might have gone into the wrong set of toilets and uh, <laughs> fallen asleep uh, a after a very big night, and they closed up the doors, and... Uh, when he woke up, um, everything was dark and locked up, and the only way he could get out was climb through a window and down a downpipe, which was pretty impressive when you consider it's about three stories high. So, uh, how he did that, I don't know, but uh, that's certainly gone into footy folklore. It's certainly our family folklore stories, that's for sure. Still reminded? Oh, it doesn't come up often, um, but uh, it always gets a laugh when um, around the kitchen table, that's for sure, when, uh, when we do raise it, because, uh, you know, whether it's his grandkids and. Um, yeah, I mean, like we've, we've just obviously had a really str- strong family for such a long period of time and, um, you know, we love each other's company and so like having a laugh together and, and certainly the grandkids, uh, uh, enjoy listening to pop stories right. and, uh, that's yeah. one of them. Yeah. So the, as you've mentioned there already, uh, Orbos, uh, Morningside living in Brisbane now in, uh, in Adelaide, uh, it's a journey you've, uh, you're obviously half completed on. Yeah, it's, um. I mean, it's, yeah, it's interesting to sort of reflect because, um, you know, I, I think why I still consider, you know, Queensland is my home. Um, you know, I've spent such a long period of time there. I love the city. Uh, you know, I love, obviously a lot of my family are there. Uh, but uh, but the weather and the lifestyle, and I still consider that home and always will. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we took we decided to take a different, uh, certainly a different uh, route and go to go to Adelaide. Um, we, we felt like we wanted to do something different with my, with my wife and, uh, and obviously my kids and, uh, and we've loved it. It's been such a great, uh, change for us. Um, enjoy the city, uh, obviously the job's good, but more importantly, the, it was a great move for our family and our kids. Um, they've really grown as people over that period of time and, um, they've, they've enjoyed the change. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I guess that would have been a, a tough time for, for you and the family at, at the time in question when you made that decision to, to leave the, mm. the home, um, given, given what had happened to you. And I suppose the, the unknown at your life there, obviously a, a year after not having the Brisbane Lions mm. coaching job and, and having a, a very successful year in the media that year. And we'll touch on that in a moment, but the unknown of, of that period, um, can I just take you back to that moment and, and what it made you do? Yeah, well, it was, it was always, I think, uh, you know, I was always going to go back into coaching. Um, I probably didn't anticipate that it was going to be as quick after. Um, I was quite content 
uh, doing the media and really enjoying that. Um, you hosted your own TV show too. Yeah, I had TV shows. A lot of, I had a uh, great variety in what I was doing, whether it was uh, reality TV, which I never thought I'd be coach of reality TV. I mean, that, that's something I never thought would be on my resume, but... Uh, Award-winning um, too, wasn't it? Award-winning. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, really, it was it was fantastic experience. Mm. Um, you know, I did go back to that. When it was first pitched to me... Um, we're talking about the recruit yes, on, uh, the, on recruit, the Fox platform? On Fox 8, yeah. And um, when it was first pitched to me as an idea, I thought, oh, this is a gimmick, like, you know. Um, and I was pretty conscious at that time that, you know, we, I didn't want to necessarily go into something that was... Uh, gimmicky um mm. so there was an element of there was an element of risk taking to to take that on um but then after the first day uh when we did the filming i my fears were late it was it was incredibly professional um you could tell that the product was going to be of a really high high standard uh, the resources were well and truly there uh, very professional people to work um to work with and um, a lot of creative minds. Um, I, I loved it. It was just such a great experience. Um, and it got me away from, I guess, the bubble of what, uh, you know, inside Clubland can give you at times. Um, gave me a really different perspective on things. And um, I, I love that time in the media. And it was a really, really tough decision to make to, to then step back into the coaching. Um, but we sort of, the kids were probably the ones that really in the end got me over the line because... Um, you know, they, they pretty much said, well, if we're going to move, um, if that's likely, then we'd like it to be this year, um, not next year. Right. And that was more the phase of their schooling and where they were at, um, given the fact that they were in year 10 uh, and they didn't want to move in year 11. That's all they'd known, obviously. That's all they'd, they'd known. Point. And um, so it was a really, uh, you know, to, for them to be able to have that um, level Adult of discussion. Yeah. yeah. And we sort of felt like it was, it was critically important to involve them in the decision. And um, you know, we clearly know that uh, the parents still the ones that have to make the end call. Mm. But uh, when they said that, that made real sense to me. Sounded like a really mature response. Um, and so we we made the call, and um, and that was a you know probably against um, you know something that was going quite well um, with mm. the media and and really enjoyed it. Um, but uh, you know, in the end, that uh, that hunger for competition, Damo, was the the thing that got me back in. Yeah, and, and Michael, I don't want this to sound too simplistic, but but by going back to a senior assistant coaching role as as you chose to do then, and and now into its fifth year with mm. with Port Adelaide, did you do so, and, and do you continue to do so with the view to to again becoming the the main man at a footy club? Well, that's certainly a long term objective. Um, I mean, you've known me long enough to know that I don't. I, I tend not to look that far in yeah. in front, but I am a goal setter as well, and. Um, and I've never, I've never tried to shy away. If that's that's been an end goal. Um, um, but at the same time, I'm always really, really conscious that um, that uh, where I'm at, they know they get the absolute best out of me, and yep. um, they get the best of me. Um, and you throw everything into it, and I don't know another way. Um, you're 100 percent in, or you're 100 percent out. Mm. It's it's something that I've always lived by, and um, you know I've really learned uh, just so much about. Uh, uh, about coaching um, mm. by my time being there and um, working with Ken has been um, absolutely brilliant. Um, it's taught me a lot of things, um, you know, about coaching. Uh, the list has evolved. Um, you know, our game style's changed, you know, a couple of times and, and how we've gone about educating that. So it's, yeah, it was an important step. It was a necessary step if um, eventually that does um, does happen. Now, whether that does on or not, I don't know. I don't know whether there's an industry... Um, we're, we're ready to have that conversation around second time coaches. Um, it doesn't seem but, right though, uh, does it? Because everyone I, I speak to w would argue that the second time round you're going to be better. It's just that the second time round doesn't often present itself to the person who's missed after a first go, has it? Yeah, it's an interesting discussion. There's probably more people that need to have that debate more than me, but, um, but yeah, you know, like I was a young captain at 21. Mm. Um, you know, you could probably argue that without, uh, Without being um, the captain at 21, would I have been as good a captain at 26 when we were, when we were premierships? And I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, you were you were there at the time when um, you know we finished dead last uh, in 1998. Oh, yeah. uh, the club was turned upside down. You had um, a broken leg in that year. I had a broken leg in Perth. Um, the club was capitulating. Uh, board was um, pretty much getting sacked. Cl coaches were getting sacked. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a really uh, really tough time to have to lead through that time when really I was. Uh, a novice really as a as a captain um and to work the way through that and then obviously have lee and um been understand what he, you know what leadership really was um learn a lot of important lessons off lee around that and then you grow as a person and um so to me that's only natural but uh at the same time 
um, you know, there's probably a conversation there for someone else. But uh, mm. for me, it's it's just more just about getting the job done and yeah, um, and giving the best of yourself. And when when you refer to as you did a few moments ago to the best of me. What was it the best of you when you were coach for the Brisbane Lions for those five years? Oh, we well, always think so at the time. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I'm always a believer that you, you, you're giving the best of what you've got. Uh, and at the time when I, um, if, if I reflect back on it, um, you know, I, I, I was obviously, uh, um, it, it was a tough job to, to take on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we just concentrate on experience alone, I mean, normally the job, it's a, it's become even bigger again, um, since that period of time. And, um, so with the skill sets at the time and the knowledge I had at the time, absolutely got the best. Now, as I said, when in that press conference, it was, uh, uh, got the best, but it wasn't good enough. And sometimes that, um, sometimes that happens. Um, and I thought that's a really important message also to, um, to my own kids, um, was that, you know what, sometimes you give your best and sometimes you don't get what you want. And, uh, um, it doesn't mean you don't try again. Was that the first time in in your life that you'd given your best and it hadn't worked? Oh no, there's plenty of other times. Um, you know, like whenever I you know I do a, a little bit of corporate speaking, and um, you know, a lot of my stories are, um, you know, funny enough, of being around when things haven't worked and how really? that's propelled um, me into other uh, other things, and um, you know, whether that was the broken leg uh, that it happened in 1998 and working through that in the club you know, almost imploding. Uh, well, you know, the, the era that eventuated was a, was on the back of that. Yeah. Uh, and the decisions that were made were on the back of that. Um, you know, share stories around, uh, some of my time with Wolsey and some of the direct feedback that I got off him over my time and really tested and challenged me as a footballer, but also my own football character. And, um, you know, without those conversations and going to a pretty bad place, um, you know, you might not have eventuated to be a best and fairest winner and a Brownlow medal winner. So um, they're really important stories for me. And they're the ones in some ways that actually define me more than some of the successes that I've had. Um, and we tend to look at the CV and the resume and they read that out. But mm. there's a whole other resume that I have that um, that people don't see, but have probably defined me more. Right. And, and to that point, um, to a point, I mean, uh, one of the All-Australian nominations you got out of, yeah. the, out of the five came in the 1999 season when you played with a, a steel rod, basically, all the way yeah. up, your, up your leg. That was, uh, that was without doubt, um, my close to my hardest year in football um, because I couldn't train at all during the week. Uh, and I, I sort of describe after that, um, when I came back for that year, uh, almost two weeks before the season started, I almost thought my year was over. Such was the pain that I was getting in my leg. Uh, and when people ask me, well, what did it feel like? I said, well, it almost feels like that when you're, when you're running or you get to a point in the game, it feels like, you know, when you get two steel rods and you bang them together and you get that shake um, through your hands. Yeah. That's what, it, that's what it felt like. Every, um, every step. Every, well, as the game went on, yes. And then sort of in the first following days after a game, that's what it'd feel like. And um, so... To be able to get through the 1999 year, having had very limited preparation and then also not training throughout the season um, and to still get all Australian, that was without doubt one of the uh, better achievements that I've had. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and making a preliminary final out of, out of nowhere too. Yeah. And then being able to finish that off. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I, <laughs> there was a different story there. But obviously, did my ankle didn't play against uh, North in that particular final um but yeah at the end of the year I, I had that right out and that made such a difference <laughs> um you know I, I couldn't have played without it in in 99 it would have been too big a risk uh because the bone would have been too weak and and chance of breaking it again but gee when i had it out i knew it was the right decision <laughs> yeah um just back on to the the coaching side of it um michael and we'll move on to other aspects of your, of your life in a moment but do you feel you're ready now if someone knocked on the door when you leave this studio today and said, we've got a job for you at a senior level, are, are you ready now? Well, I couldn't answer that without necessarily creating a headline, Damo, but uh, no, <laughs> I mean, the reality is, is that, um, I'm not trying I, to get I'm a very, way, I'm, no, I'm a very different, uh, uh, very different, um, coach to the, to when I turned up on that first day at the Brisbane Lions. Um, you know, I, I guess for me is that if, if my name won me the first job, you'd like to think your coaching skill sets win you the next one. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that experience that you've been able to generate over a long period of time, um, you learn a heap. Um, you're certainly more defined in the philosophies and, um, that you have as a, as a coach and, and get to learn more about what works and what doesn't work. But it's, it's just constantly challenging. Um, the whole environment's changing. I and mean, even in the, 
in the space of um, you know three or four years, and you look at what Richmond are doing and Collingwood around this connection piece, and mm. um, you know how players now process information and um, showing vulnerability, and I mean even that's changed. You know, like we it, once upon a time when that was um, in in my era coming through, if there was an element of vulnerability showed, you almost classified as weak. Mm. Um, it was more about strength and showing strength and. Um, so and, there's, and a, you were, there's a you whole different You were the poster language. boy for that, weren't you? For, for, for a period. I mean, you did have vulnerabilities privately, but when it came to presenting to your footy club and the broader footy world, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I've always, um, you know, I always believed that this, the one thing that I think has changed a lot in, in AFL football in general is that, you know, you used to go to football and you'd be a footballer. Um, you go train mm -hmm. and you go, and once you walked out that door, um, you had your life. Uh, and they were quite separate. And whereas now with the, you know, the social media and, um, and, and the lifestyle, it's, it's now just all merged. Um, you know, players are now identities, um, you know, and, and personalities and, um, they've got presence on social media mm -hmm. and, um, you know, seeking likes and all these things that, that go on now. So their football now transcends into their life. Whereas when I played, it was very much, um, compartmentalized, you know, yeah, it? it was compartmentalized yeah. into what you could do. So it was almost like, don't bring your life into your, your, your football. Um, so I always had a really big thing around there was, um, whenever I turned that handle every day and I went to go downstairs, um, into the Brisbane Lions facility, um, I had to be on, I had to be consistent. Um, I couldn't be this moody guy that was up and down. They had to know that they had a leader that was composed, was sure, was certain, um, knew where we needed to go. And, uh, and in some ways I'll show you how to get there, um, mm -hmm. in the way you went about it. And, um, whereas now we, we, we probably, um, embrace the fact that people bring their story yep. um, you know, we, we embrace we ask the them fact to bring that their story. we ask them to bring their story. We ask them to share it. Um, we uh, we ask them to open their own lives up and give us an insight in what they're going through. And um, and that that the stuff that's now going on in life has a direct um, relation to, in some instances, around how they perform. And um, so we have to understand that. We have to uh, get to know the player at a really deeper level than once there was. And, and resources say we can do that better now. Um, and so that's where it's the, the landscape has generally changed. Do you like the change? I do. It's, um, I don't know whether it's just me as a, as a person who's, um, more evolved, um, and a father now as a, and a father, beyond teenagers. um, and, and sort of getting understand all that, but, um, you know, the language change and I'm sure we had our own language as well, but, uh, yeah, learning the vernacular that, uh, that they have. And, um, but you know, like I, I remember I went to, um, uh, listen to one of the former All Blacks coaches speak, and and he just said, "Well, look, you know, like I, I have to, I have to acknowledge that it's me that has to change, um, and because this is where the momentum is going, this is what's actually happening now. The old school values still, they still live, they're still strong, um, but you also have to acknowledge that it's like, well, you know, that wave of momentum that you have and the." the just pure demographics of the people coming through, well, it, it forces you to evolve as a person, as a coach. Mm. Um, otherwise, if you don't, well, you're just going to continually fight it yeah. and you just don't get anywhere. Yeah. Um, you've never been one to have regrets in in life, but when you reflect, do you, do you think you might have taken another path? Tony Kelly, who was then the chairman of the, the yeah. Lions, mm. knocking on your door the way he did to replace Lee Matthews as coach. Time over again, would you still say yes? Yeah, I'd, I'd, no, I'd definitely go on that path um, yeah. towards uh, um, trying to build my own skill sets as a coach. Um, and, un and I understand that better, the difference between that player and that coach um, than probably what I did then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think I've, I've certainly been on record to say that I would take a different path. Um, so, so, also, so, so not accept the senior job? Yeah, step I'd, I'd, step, I'd step away from yeah. that, not accepting it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a real. It's just a really interesting when it's offered. You know, when it's offered yeah. like that. How do you um, say no? How, how do you say no? And and with um, Lee's endorsement too. Lee's endorsement. Um, you know, my old club. Um, yeah, it's fine to sort of sit back and sort of say with hindsight. Yeah. In me, no, I wouldn't. But because you won a final too. Yeah, you, and the first, first year, year we, we we play in the finals. Exciting MCG um, final against Carlton. Yeah, we well, so that was at the Gabba, and then we come down and played the Bulldogs, um, which the Bull, we lost to the Bulldogs uh, in MCG, but. 
look, it, it's um, at the time it felt right. Mm. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, we know that uh, we probably would have done something different. And um, But I, I've never for one moment um, regretted it. Yep. Um, I just – I've never lived like that. I just – No. And you make decisions, it. you follow through on it, um, you give it the best you can – um, and uh, if it doesn't work out, then so be it. But I'm not one to sit on the couch and wonder. I'll never mm. be that person. Um, and I, I realised that probably over that time, it, that that view um, was always going to grate against some. Um, but, you know, whenever you're trying to create something new, you're always butting against existing beliefs. Yeah. And if you butt against existing beliefs, you're going to hit confrontation. Um until you can change that opinion. Um, now, the only thing I'm disappointed was I couldn't change that opinion probably, but uh, but that would be the only thing that I'd be look back and sort of say, oh, I wish I could have, I wish I could have done it for that mm. reason. But um, but yeah, for me, it's about uh, at times it's taking some risks and, um, and 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 showing a little bit of courage in in doing things, um, but also being aware of um, your surroundings in your environment. And it was certainly a, a challenging environment at that particular time. Yeah, it was for so many reasons. Your relationship with Lee Matthews and the impact he's had on you as a, as a footballer, primarily or firstly, and then, and then probably more importantly as a person, can I get you to please reflect on that? Um, to, to sort of summarize, I guess, Lee's impact on me. I mean, I don't speak to him every day. I don't, uh, um, but he's, he's almost like a second father figure to me. Um, I just learn an enormous amount off him. Uh, I, I, I guess Lee is just such a leader of men. Um, mm. and he, and he subtly taught me all these, um, subtle ways on how to lead and, uh, whether it's through a, a phone call or a coffee or, or not talking to me or, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he just had a, he had a way of being able to do that. Um, but the thing that also Lee had was, he, well, he had presence that that's without mm. doubt and still probably has that. Um, but he's such, so pragmatic in his views that it's hard to disagree with him. Um, <laughs> I never won an argument against him. Um, never, ever. I always come in with a strong argument and lost every time um, and come out agreeing with him. Such was his um, pragmatism. Um, but he was he was so good at being able to just make it sound really simple. And, and then he could go into a room and he could communicate it really clear in a really simple format that everyone understood, which got everyone on the same page. I still think that that was one of his real genuine strengths. Mm. Um and he, he, was, he wasn't too bad at the man management side of things. Um, you know, he, 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 uh, he managed Acker in a, in a different way. Um, it was the first time I'd heard a terminology, uh, and he probably won't like me saying this, Acker, but as a consultant. Um, but it was his way of being able to manage everyone else when we were all going to Lee saying, mate, are we going to keep putting up with this? And, uh, yeah. and, and his response was, no, he makes us better. Um, he's right. not necessarily the, the team player that we have, but... Um, you know, we've got to look at him as a consultant. He has a special set of skills um, that he brings to the table, but he's not necessarily intertwined into well, how the team operates. I've never um, heard that term used on, on anyone in a, on a football list. Yeah. Even well, though we knew what was going on. Yeah, we, but that that was that's the, the way that he spoke to us. And, it um, made sense to deal with it that way. Made, it? made sense to us. Yeah. And um, that, that might sound a little bit disparaging to no, it's not. It's actually, I know. It's actually not. No. Um, but he, he made us better and mm. we bought into that concept. And look, I was obviously going to raise the name Jason Ackermanis somewhere here. I wasn't sure how, but you, you raised it before I got to it. Um, you were so close. So you grew up together in Queensland mm. and I know how much it hurt you when that blew up. I mean, you, you, you were torn, weren't you, when that moment reached its crescendo and, you know, you, you had private and obviously public conversations about him and, and with him. Um, is it is it a re one of those regrets that you've learnt from? Is it is it how do you look no, back? No, it was it, that was an interesting uh, difference in leadership. Um, you know, there was a coach and a player that were at odds with one another, and I was the captain in the middle. Um, and uh, it was actually a really difficult scenario to try and manage. But there was a point where I, I felt that um, it was starting to become um, damaging to the group. Um, and so a call needed to be made. Yep. Um, now, whether Lee made that um, with the support of us or it was encouraged, it doesn't really matter. Um, the reality is it couldn't go on. Yep. Um, and, you, and you said that at the time. Yeah, it, it, yep. it just couldn't go on. And so a call had to be made um, because, you know, the, the team was a, the, the thing that was get, getting hurt the most. So, uh, and so, you know, the call was made um, well and truly supported uh, by myself and a lot of others. Um, and that put at odds my relationship with uh, with Jason. Um, I didn't receive some favourable messages from him, and that's that, that's fair enough. But um, 
you know, the one thing we could never compromise was uh, what the team was about and um, and it was getting seriously compromised at that particular time. So it was pretty tough, but mm. um, it was needed. Have you patched things up to a point? Oh, like yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I mean, you, we uh, still catch up every year. You know, we, we try to... Uh, we try to have a a time on the Thursday before the grand finals. You might yeah. you might be aware of one of those, Damo. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and yeah, we so we, we we catch up and you know we we talk because the reality is is that um, you know it's like uh, with Chris and Brad and um, Scott that is and you know I don't I don't call them every day, but yet when I catch up with them, we could sit there and talk for hours. Um, it's just you just have this innate. Connection. Uh, connection with uh, with people because you've played in the premiership. And that's the one thing that, you know, you can't necessarily share with players is yeah. about what's this permanent connection that you have with yeah. one another once you win a premiership together. And um, and so we'll always have that. Yeah. You, you mentioned the Aki Manus thing there. Um, another one when you're, you're a coach, you, you again, as, as coaches are forced to do, and, and Mick Moldhouse has always been one to subscribe to, you have to make decisions um, on the run sometimes, but you make them with the right intent. You made a, a big call on another mate, Daniel Bradshaw, at a time, which which obviously impacted on a relationship there. Do, would you do that again? Um, and oh, oh, I, would have, I would have no problem um, doing it if it involved uh, a, a player that I knew and it was required. Yeah. Um, I had more of a problem in, in how it eventuated yeah. um, and, and sort of the Chinese whispers out there. So I, I was more disappointed in myself over that because I didn't follow through on my word. Right. Um, and the scenario changed a couple of days later. Um, I'm comfortable um, that it was that it was communicated, um, but uh, you know I've probably since found out that there were some other things that were going on I was not aware of um, that might have led to him thinking that I wasn't telling him the truth. Right. Um, but in my eyes, it was it was the clear truth. Mm. Um, but I do wish that I followed through on my word. That's my only. Um, yeah. That's the only thing I reflect on and sort of say that I would do differently. But. Um, you know, if a, if a situation ever presented where you have to represent the club, the club. and the team and, and you've got to make a call, well, um, I, I've just, since that time, I've just said, just be honest, you know, like just be, mm. um, and follow through on your word. And that's, you know, I learned a lot out of that, um, particular scenario. And, um, you know, anytime I was faced with the same, um, situation, that's what I was. Um, you know, I probably had a similar um, situation even with Luke Power um, and, and having to probably have a conversation around whether he should um, retire or not. And um, and I just thought it was really important just to be honest yep. um, through that conversation. And um, and and, you, and if you're honest and upfront, um, then hopefully the relationship certainly, um, you know, they might not like it at the time, but, um, but they certainly understand in the long term. Mm. And just for, for those listening um, who don't know what we're referring to, there was a, the whole Brendan Favola time. Yeah. Um, you brought him to the club. It, that didn't work out for reasons beyond your control. But it did spark football there for a, a period of time when he was on song there for, for that half season, didn't it? Yeah, well, we were having sort of yeah 32,000 people at the at the Gabba and um, we had a great membership base. Um, yeah, it was like it was, um, it, it was an interesting time. I mean, it's – you know, I heard, uh, I heard Brad um, – talking the other day and he was talking about um you know building hope staying competitive um you know a yeah the football club that can afford to um go down you mm. know and and trying to still sell a hope message and still sell a competitive message it's really difficult when you're at a club that needs to you know when finances stay become and yeah. stay relevant um and brisbane market's been that like that forever um uh, you know, really fortunately, they they certainly look like they're working their way through that, which is fantastic. Um, but the the that whole market there is just a different market, um, and I don't think that that's necessarily. I think it's become appreciated from AFL House, but I think it's taken a really long time to get there yeah. um, to do that. Uh, it's it's a different market, um, and uh, and you have to stay relevant. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it was a it was a. Uh, it was a decision that was made to get him up, um, and it didn't work. Um, and it certainly, yeah, it certainly was not a great decision to get him there. Um, and it didn't work for him, and it certainly didn't work for us. Mm. Back to the playing career, um, the, the conversation couldn't be had unless three names were mentioned: Voss, Buckley, and, and Heard. There, there was a bond there at the at the time that might have been distant. Um, it, it's still there in some form now. Are you are you close to those guys? Have you conversed in in recent times? Uh, not in recent times, um, not with uh, Hurdy recently. Um, you know, Bucks is uh, every now and then conversation. Um, yeah, again, not all the time. Uh, I think people um, 
forget a little bit that uh, of Bucks' time. You were teammates. Brisbane. You were yeah. teammates and uh, actually good and actually mates. Um, you know, you, you said Chapman. you learned something from him even even at that 1993 oh, year. He was, um, he was an intense character that I've ever come across. I was... I was uh, I always remember going uh, back home to chat to my dad and God, I just, dad, I don't know whether I can be like that. Like, <laughs> um, if I have to be that intense, I don't know whether I want to be that good a player. Um, Cause you, you'd played in 92, played six games in your debut year. Yeah. Wearing number 56. Yes, that's correct. And yep. then Nathan yep. Buckley walks into the footy club yeah. in 93. Yeah. But I think the, he was, he was in another way so good for our football club too, because, um, you know, he came in with a real confidence in the way that, uh, you know, he played, um, he came in with a real presence, but he came in this with this real determination. I think that really grated on a lot of, um, people at the time. And unfortunately so, because, um, we need, we desperately needed it. Mm. You know, we needed, we needed players that we could, we could look at and sort of say, geez, that's a, that's a pretty impressive work rate. Um, and it, you know, his passion for football, um, was, you know, was unbelievable. Um, and so it sort of taught me a new level of, um, by just observing, not right. so much about what he was um, saying or necessarily doing, but just observing him saying, oh, I've got to go to another level here. Um, you know, this guy's walked in, he's, he works his absolute butt off. Um, he does all the extras. Um, you know, he's, he, he loves footy hmm. and he's so intense. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that intensity did overflow for him. Which he now um, concedes. Yeah, which he now concedes, and and you, you clearly see him as a leader today. But um, you know the way he goes about it is, um, you know, everyone talks how fantastic that is. Um, but you know, and I, I sort of guess as a young player, and I was what seventeen, eighteen, um, so I was pretty young when you're coming to um, talking about football and got to learn about um, Nathan Buckley and uh, and what he did. And he was a twenty one year old man that taught me. A lot of things, and so on the back of that, even though he left, um, that really stayed with me. Yeah, and when you refer there, you, you went home and st- spoke to your dad, Gary, uh, about that intensity. Can you recall some of the specifics of of what really made you step up and, and notice how this man was driven? Oh, uh, n- not so much. It was more his training intensity. Like when he trained, um, it was for keeps. He just every time he walked on the park, um, he he was training um, like he was going to play that day. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and he just had a football in his hands all the time. Now, as a growing up as a kid, I, I used to do that a little bit myself. But um, but you know, as you start to come into AFL, you forget about you can sometimes forget about the love of the game and uh, and how important the love of the game is. Um, you know, playing it because it turns into somewhat a job. But this guy had a love of the game, and um, and that was the thing that I just that was really striking to me. And and the first thing I knew that I had to do if I was going to be a consistent AFL player, then my training had to go to another level. Right. Mm. Yeah. Michael, the, the three premierships in a, in a row. Um, the first one, I would say, for obvious reasons, the most important. Is that is that fair to say? It was significant breakthrough. I mean, and it's significant breakthrough in different. Uh, in a different way to what might be, um, you might think. Um, for me, growing up in Queensland, uh, you know, you, you're ridiculed as a as an yeah. AFL player. I mean, it's a very different landscape today for kids playing AFL football in Queensland. What a, what it was um, in 1987. Um, you know, we had two kids in the whole school playing. Um, rugby league was dominant, and rugby union. Um, there wasn't another language spoken. Um, and if you were playing that other, uh, that other game, um, you're ridiculed. Um, so to be able to sort of work our way through all that and then have, um, win a premiership and then just see this wave of, um, momentum and sentiment about our game and the explosion of participation was probably the most proudest part of it all. Mm. Um, and the fact that you're yeah, this kid that grows up in Queensland, um, driving down the freeway, um, getting picked up from some teammates that uh, on the way down to Carrara and having 300 people turn up. Half my school didn't even know what I was doing, even though I was in year 11 at school. Um, you know, and then be this guy standing on the dice at the MCG and then coming back and going, having a, a ticket tech parade down the middle of um, Queen Street Mall with, you know, thousands of, uh, of people um, lining the streets. I mean, that's something else um, yeah. because you've – You've changed people's minds. You've changed people's views, um, and uh, about our game. And um, you know that's something that I'll always um, really hold dear to me, even more so than the premiership itself. Really, yeah, absolutely. 
And but the only thing you didn't personally achieve was win a, a Norm Smith medal. But I reckon <laughs> yeah. when people look back at maybe the first two and maybe all three, there's a case to be made you could have won a, a couple of them as well. Case, but I don't have it. Uh, <laughs> so it's uh, no. It's I think that um, uh, I think at the start of an AFL grand final. Um, all you're worried about is you don't actually play on the guy who wins the Norm Smith medal. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the gut, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the fear factor. Um, yeah. You know, you're as much about managing your fear as anything else on yeah. that day. And certainly my my anxiety levels and fear levels was more around, gee, I hope I don't get to play on the guy who actually uh, wins the Norm Smith medal, which actually – He uh, played on Bucks. Coincidentally, <laughs> it was, was me, <laughs> um, which is the one everyone uh, suggests that I should have won. Should have won, but, yeah. um, but uh, that was yeah that was a, that was a fantastic contest on the day and um, and went to a worthy winner um, and and all of them did so it's sort of mm. to state a case for yourself you almost have to state a case against why someone else wouldn't and I just I couldn't do that yeah I could kick five in one of those and, and didn't win one too didn't he yeah so. but he ran around the whole last quarter saying he should have been the North Smith medalist so I mean he'd already announced himself at three quarter time let alone uh, afterwards but you know a performance of thirty nine disposals. Um, you know, it was pretty impressive too. Yes, it was. By the bloke who won it, uh, yes, that's Simon correct. Black. Just yeah. getting back to that, uh, that that sick feeling before a game. Was that every game? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, I guess I learned to manage that over over time. Um, but I was I always had fear um, about what could happen in the game. Was I good enough? Um, even you know, as the best, or, absolutely, or, or near best, you still had that. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah um, you know, what if I get beaten today? Hmm. Um, all those seeds of doubt that run through your mind um, before a game, and um, eventually, I think as maturity, uh, you, you start to mature your thoughts, um, and you start to think a little bit more around what you got to do. But also, as you start to mature, you start to realise that um, I don't even know why I'm thinking about the game until I actually get to do something about it. Um, right. So it's so, a wasted energy. So it becomes wasted yeah. energy. Um, you know, and you can build yourself up a lot. Um, but in the end, the only thing, the only time you actually get to do anything about it is when the siren sounds and, and it's go time. Um, so I was very much, um, sort of just become really clear on what I needed to do. And, and mine was, mine was pretty simple. Like I just had to hit body as early as I possibly could, right. um, in the game and as many times as I could. <laughs> Um, and, and the other part was, was that whatever got me in the game, whether that was with my mouth or, I was or, with, say, that or was a with, key with my puddle. body, <laughs> yeah, it was like I had to target someone, yeah. um, in my own mind. And once I had that target in my mind and, and once I had that, uh, couple of things that I wanted to focus on, then I just let the, let it happen. And, um, you know, it doesn't always work clearly. Um, you don't go out and play a great game every game you play, but, um, but certainly, I, I sort of the more mature you become, you realise that period before the game is actually wasted emotion. Mm. When you watch uh, Gary Ablett now, who's at the clearly at the, at the tail end of his career, and yet still being able to get three, I'm assuming Brownlow medal votes, quite possibly in the in the in the most recent weeks where, where, in which we're speaking, can you relate to that to that older player when the the body just can't do what it once could, but the mind wants to take you there. He, he's working out a way, as we speak anyway, a way to do it. Um, how, how, how skillful do you need to be to do, be doing what he's doing? Oh, well, that speaks to his longevity. I, you know, it, amazing. I mean, we've sort of Roger Federer, um, maybe we're learning how to do this, mate, but we're talking about freaks of nature here, aren't we? Like you're putting up some serious names um, who have the capacity to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, no doubt there's a, there's a slowing down period um, and you still feel like you're going as fast um, because the, the mind's still operating as, as clearly as it needs to, but the body just doesn't go as quick as it, as it used to. And I'm still, th I'm still sure that <laughs> despite as good as he's going, can you believe it? There's probably things that Gaz would still like to be doing more of um, that he once could do that he mm. can't do now. But um, I'm really pleased that we're actually um, appreciating uh, Gary for what he's doing and, yeah. and, and how he plays and appreciate him for um, the, the player the years, not so much what he was. Yeah. Um, because, you know, often the, the biggest enemy you fight is actually your own success. Um, mm. and, and when you're coming off a, um, a fair <laughs> a pedestal mm. uh, in Gary Ablett, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty big to live up to, but uh, somehow he's doing it. It's pretty incredible. Who of the, the, the modern great uh, Vossi is it that you most like watching? Oh, of the, of the greats. Um, is, is it Dusty? Is it yeah, the, I is think it? there's uh, I think there's a sort of variety of guys. No one's sort of really 
jumping out at me, I've got to say, although if I'm watching football, I am a still a football lover. So mm. you still appreciate the, the, the amazing acts you see on the, on the football field. And, um, you know, whether that's, uh, I hope you don't get to see it tonight, but, uh, whether that's Dugowie and, you know, and some of these power that he has, um, yep. and I don't know whether I necessarily, um, I guess I don't necessarily, uh, um, look at all clubs or anything like that. I guess Isaac Heaney is is a uh, is one, and I, of all the current players um, that I look at, um, he resembles um, me more than any other. I think um, so. I sort of probably just like to watch him because mm. I think he's. Um, uh, he, I've got some. I had some attributes. I think that he, that he has. So that, that'd um, be big for him to be uh, described by you as someone that you like. Yeah, I, I just love watching him play. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's 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 not the most skillful, but he's he's certainly very competent. But he's he's mm. tough and he's clean and um, and uh, and I'm, you know, I, I like he's good overhead. Uh, can go forward and kick goal if he needs to. Um, I think he's a he's a wonderful talent um, that'll only get better and better. Um, but generally, I just appreciate the stars, you know, um, whether that's Gaz doing what Gaz does um, with the skill that he's got or whether that's Dugowie and his power, and hopefully I don't see much of that tonight. <laughs> okay. Now, I didn't quite get an answer to that question I did ask you about 25 minutes ago. Are you ready to coach again, senior level? Um, no, I, I couldn't answer that, Damon, because the, the reality is, is that I, I, of course, if you're, if you're, um, if the option's there, you, you'd, explore uh, it. you'd explore it. Um, but I, I just, I, ca I couldn't shift my mind there cause it's just not because the way not that I, yeah, yeah, because it's just, so it's the, the hypothetical that yeah. could have been, um, you know, option. And I just, uh, I've just never been hardwired that way. It's mm. not an, it's not avoiding the answer. Um, I think the the obvious way to answer that is is that um, that I did answer it in the way that yes, clearly I got back into this um, to be a head coach again. Um, I've I've said that more uh, than on one occasion, but I'm also the guy that knows that the job's going to get done now, um, and uh, and that's where your sole focus has got to lie. Mm -hmm. And we've got a big job at hand, and that's where the competitive boost is still. That's in right. You. Yeah, yeah, and you've got the exciting. Uh, we've got an exciting group to work with, and. Every day you rock up and you're still looking for a better way of how to do things and and how how we should handle the week and and plot the downfall of Collingwood, mm. um, and then go into the next week and and that's that's what we live by. But I also understand at the same time, you know, part of um, part of the media is forecasting and uh, and sort of looking forward about what could happen and what might not happen. And um, I did that only for a short little while, um, <laughs> yeah. but in the main, we live in the now and we have to yeah. deal with the now and we have to make the most of it. And, uh, and that's what they'll get. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your, your time today and, and, uh, for always your, your professionalism and, uh, honesty and integrity with which you've, uh, carried yourself and, and been open in this, in the game podcast. Thanks for your time, mate. <laughs>